so um yeah so i i found that i still have a couple of things to say about this, this so-called moduli stack of acute triangles and uh on the other hand i still haven't managed to figure out everything about it so there's still things i don't really know about it but um so uh let's see maybe it'll help if i uh just to turn on this screen sharing thing here uh is that visible now um yes okay so that's some notes from our discussion last time and maybe these pictures will help to remind us or explain things to us um so uh Uh, yeah, I have these pictures conveniently labeled. It looks like A got changed into a little E. Sorry, let me just try to fix that. That's so annoying. Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> a, a is a handwriting recognition. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Ah, ignore that thing, whatever it is. There's no way to get rid of those. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You know that? Really? I don't know. Uh, well, I, you know, I, 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 for a person who knows how, what they're doing, there must be an easy way to get rid of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, okay. uh, so I, I, I wanted to refer to picture B over here, which is on the right hand over on here, because that's like a picture, a very bad picture of this uh, Coxeter tessellation. Um, uh, I mean, it's like a tessellation of fundamental domains for the extended modular group. Am I saying that correctly? Which is, uh, you can think of it as GL2Z acting on the upper half plane. And um, picture D is actually the same tessellation, but drawn in this Beltrami Klein projection, which is a non conformal projection, but um, that seems so correct. That yeah, I, I think that what? Is that where the GD6 is straight lines? Is that there? Yes, <laughs> they're supposed to be. Those are attempted straight lines. Uh, mm -hmm. That's right, that's right. And um, so um, this, uh, this topic started for me with noticing that, well, I mean, so uh, what, what am I trying to say? That the, mm, this tessellation for the extended modular group, it's uh, semi-famously related to the moduli stack of elliptic curves. So I guess people tell me that what, that this, let's say this is the origin right there. That's where zero is. And, um, this is some famous. Yep. That's the fundamental domain, per preferred favorite fundamental domain for the. Uh, for this moduli stack of uh, elliptic curves. Um, but I noticed from staring at this picture that there's another thing that you can look at in this picture. Uh, there's. A, a slightly different thing, which I prefer to think about, which is this thing over here. And the reason I like looking at that one is it really helps me to understand the relationship between acute triangles and elliptic curves um, that you know, there's this unit interval at at the bottom. The universe interval is right there. Uh-huh. And there's this semicircle based on the unit interval. And it uh there's some famous Euclid theorem or something that says that, you know, the what the right triangle, the right angles, the right triangles based on this unit interval have their apex right on the that semicircle. Yep. And so if you want to go obtuse, you go beneath that semicircle. If you want to go acute, 
you go above that semicircle. And um, so I, I read somewhere that, you know, Dedekind actually proved it's the obvious fact that uh, apparently Dedekind invented this picture, apparently, but he didn't draw it. Uh, Klein <laughs> drew it, apparently. Um, and, um, but D Dedekind noted the obvious fact that you can get, what am I trying to say? That these are the tiles, they are the fundamental domain, the fundamental domains for the extended modular group, but you can put any two of them together. Uh, sorry, they're supposed to be black and white color. It's supposed to be a black and white sort of checkerboard type, type style, style, style. And then um, if you put any black, and any white one together, you get a fundamental domain for the unextended modular group, which is SL2, comma Z. And yeah, the, the usual favorite one is that one we drew first, but uh, you know you can take any of them. So I've actually got six of them in this little blue outlined region, but you can take any two of those and that'll give you a fundamental domain for the uh, For the, for, for the unextended modular group for SL2Z. Um, but so the point is supposed to be that every acute triangle that you can draw is up to similarity represented among the acute triangles that you get by having your apex somewhere in this region, you know, and just dropping down the sides to the, to the unit interval. Every, every, every acute triangle is represented in there, but it's actually overrepresented. It actually shows up six times. And um, you know, if you if you convert this to the Beltrami Klein picture, then you can see that this six-fold overrepresentation is showing up in the picture this way. Right. So this this vertical strip that I outlined in blue is showing up, I guess outlined in green as this equilateral triangle in the middle of the, the, the disc. And you can see that, you know, the, the group three bang is acting on this equilateral triangle, of course. And um, so the, you, you know, the, the, the over-representation of the acute triangles in the vertical strip picture is accounted for by the fact that, you know, we're just really, modding out by this symmetry group, which you can see more clearly in the uh, Beltrami-Klein picture. Because, you know, in the Beltrami-Klein picture, this equilateral triangle really looks equilateral, whereas it's a little bit distorted in this, uh, in this vertical strip picture. But in the vertical strip picture, I, I like the fact that you can see this sort of universal bundle of, of, of acute triangles over the moduli stack. They're, you know, explicit, representatives, uh, you know, you actually see all those acute triangles, but they're a little bit, the acute triangles that correspond to each point in this Beltrami-Klein picture, it's a little bit more indirect trying to see what they are. Yeah, you know, I, I, maybe the best way to do it is to find the corresponding point over here and then look at the acute tri triangle over there. But, um, so, <laughs> all right, let me, let me, let me, uh, I'm, right, I'm just, Trying to, I guess I was just trying to review some of the ideas that made me start thinking about this. But maybe I should say that, um, trying to pull back and give a little bit bigger picture. So, you know, my vague idea about this is, you know, I'm not, I'm not intending this as serious mathematics, right? Because I never intend anything as serious mathematics. But um, this is like, um, you know, this is supposed to be in one in one sense. It's supposed to be a stepping stone to things like the moduli stack of elliptic curves, which is allegedly serious mathematics. So I like these stepping stones to uh, serious mathematics, and um, and and the connection between these two moduli stacks, the moduli stack of elliptic curves and the moduli stack of uh, acute triangles, is that. You know, each elliptic curve has a fundamental domain that's a parallelogram, but that parallelogram is really, you know, two acute triangles stuck together. Well, two triangles stuck together, but you can more or less uniquely uh, pick out 
a special acute representative for those. And um, I mean, so another way you can say this very roughly speaking is that the, uh, the, the moduli stack of elliptic curves, um, this is very sloppy, but it's okay. Moduli stack of elliptic curves and the moduli stack of uh, acute triangles, they're really the same moduli stack or moduli space and the same space or the same stack, except, I mean, they have the same fundamental domain, but they just have different boundary conditions. So <coughs> that, you know, when you're in the, when you're in the moduli stack of uh, elliptic curves, if you, hit the wall, you come out on the other side or something like that. Um, whereas if you're in the moduli stack of elliptic curve, a uh, moduli stack of acute triangles, and if you hit the wall, you just hit the wall. Uh, you know, you, you, you've hit a, a right triangle, which is sort of an honorary acute triangle, but you can't go any further. You can't, you know, you, 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 it, won't, it won't be acute anymore if you go any further. So you kind of just hit the wall. Um, but, uh, you know, so this helps me, go ahead. Yeah. But if you allow yourself, maybe this is stupid, but if you allow yourself to uh, identify a triangle and it's reflected version. Yeah, that's one of the things I'm being incredibly sloppy about. <laughs> right. Yeah, but if, if you allow yourself to do that, then you can pop out the other side, right? Like that place uh, where you hit the, the wall the there, right? That's the opposite I, mean, I mean, that's involved in how the, how the, crossing through the wall works when you're dealing with elliptic curves. That's what I'm saying. If you, if you hit a rectangle, you know, you got your parallelogram and when it hits a rectangle, that's the place where you can, you have ambiguity as to where to draw the diagonal because they both give you sort of acute triangles. You know, they both give you right triangles, which, you know, and, and that's, so are you saying something like that? What are you saying, John? No, I was just saying that, like, well, I, I wish I could actually move my cursor right. in a way that you would right. see me. But anyway, you drew this little line here of a point in the moduli space of acute triangles going and hitting a wall. Bonk. Yes, yes. Uh, and then I'm just saying that if you pop out to the other side, if you go to the mirror image oh. other side there, you could continue moving on, and then you'd be dealing with reflected versions of the of the triangle you had. Maybe before. you're right. Maybe you're right. But, 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 but if you identify mirror image, then those two sides, those two sides of the domain are the same. So you're actually approaching it from both sides at the same time. I guess you're right. So yeah, right. I mean, we have oh. this choice about whether to include the orientation on, uh, as part of the structure or not. And if you omit the orientation from the structure, then you're just sort of folding the moduli stack across this mirrors, I guess this vertical mirror in the middle and <laughs> then what's happening. So then those two edges are becoming the same. But also the, yeah, but as Simon said, also the, yeah, the regions, the regions are becoming the same, the, like the black and the white region, if you call these black and white. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, that's that's a, point, yeah. Okay, so maybe, so you think the point is that like, this is all distraction and that you should really think of the the two moduli spaces stacks, one for acute triangles and one for elliptic curves, are different in that. I don't know. I'm confused. Yeah, I mean, I'm very sloppy about this. This is fun to figure out. Uh, we can figure it out if we want to, but. Um, Okay, well, you made it. Well, I, don't, yeah, I don't feel an urge. What? I don't feel a strong urge to figure it out right this second, but uh, I thought you were like yeah, saying what yeah. the difference was or, or something like that between those two models. No, I'm just being incredibly sloppy about all this. I mean, this is these are fun observations that you're bringing up, maybe more fun than the ones I'm bringing up, but um, I'm not sure what to say about them other than that I think we could figure them out when we, when necessary, we can figure them out. But okay, I'm, I'm, I'm still distracting myself from saying something big picture here that I was trying to say. Yeah, again, that, that's better, do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, which was um, that, you know, this sort of toy modular stack as a stepping stone to more serious modular stack. So I have the vague idea that, 
I mean, this, so this is an arguable, I, I could as, as, as easily argue against it as argue in, in favor, or I could argue for some competitor. But this is, this is an example of a Grotendieck topos that I might, I might try to argue that this would be a good first example for, for everyone to learn as an example of a Grotendieck topos. Um, so it's, it's really just this, this, one way you can think of it is it's this equilateral triangle. Um, but then we want to take the orbit topos under the action of this symmetry group three bang. So it's, you know, so I'm just saying it's like the, uh, you know, if we make it into an actual topos, the, the, it would be the sheaves, it would be the equivariant sheaves over this uh, equilateral triangle. Um, you know, that's an actual Grotendieck topos. And it's sort of a fun topos to, to think about. Uh, it, so, I, you know, if you think about the topos in, sort of in terms of its points, then its points are sort of uh, equal, out, sorry, are sort of acute triangles. So it's like you could, you could call it the, the topos of acute triangles. And, you know, in, 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 in suggesting to argue that this is a good first example or things like this are a good first example for people to learn of Grotendieck toposes, um, you know, the idea, the idea, part of the idea is that you get the sense that, well, the points of a topos are kind of interesting. They're not just points, they are objects of some kind, you know, like an acute triangle is like an object and the object itself, the acute triangle could have some symmetries. It could be an isosceles acute triangle or even an equilateral acute triangle. And, you know, roughly speaking, that's a first idea of what a topos is. It's like a topological space, except it's more fun because the points can have automorphisms and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so this is also sounds a lot like an orbifold. So, you know, various people have, told me you agreed with me that you know you, it's a good idea to think of orbifolds as Grotendieck toposes. Um, you know, so in other words, understand an orbifold by understanding the equivariant sheaves o o o over the over it, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And um, and you know, so you could also I mean like when you think of you know a topos as a geometric like, again, I think of a topos as a theory, sort of, but the models of the theory are the points of the topos, right? It's a, it's a model, it's a, sorry, the, the Grotendieck topos, you can think of it as a theory in the doctrine of geometric theories, <laughs> something like that. It, it's a, yeah, it's a geometric theory. And um, you can, you know, you can imagine sort of uh, sketching the theory or you know sort of like axiomatizing the theory or something like that you could say that well it's like the theory of a of an unordered three tuple of real numbers and, and those real numbers might represent something like the angles of the triangle or something like that. And, you know, there are ways you can put this into geometric logic. You can, exp you can write down a, an axiomatization of this geometric theory in, you know, the syntax of geometric logic. Uh, I'm being very sloppy about that too, because for one thing, I tend to write, I tend to use my, my syntax. I tend to use a different syntax from the way Lots of other people you write the syntax of geometric theories, but you could, it, you know, you you could you could express this theory in some in the syntax of geometric logic, and moreover, you can express it in a way that really makes it sound like the models are acute triangles. <laughs> um, uh, but you can also so so right. There's another picture that we can draw of this moduli stack. It's a very sloppy picture. So I mean. Let me draw a little sector here, one sixth of this equilateral triangle, right? Because when we're taking the orbit topos, we're sort of folding that over onto that. So, right, if we if if we took the orbit space instead of the orbit topos, then we would just get this, you know, this this topological space that's one, this one sixth sector of the equilateral triangle. But um, 
But if we take the orbit <laughs> combos, then we're getting, you know, these very stacky points. We're getting this. <laughs> so what's going on here? Uh, D mod six, sorry, a, an a, an, a three bang symmetry for the point right in the middle there, the equilateral triangle. Okay, okay, so that's a very stacky point. That's a highly stacky point, but where are the other stacky points? And then we get some um, isosceles triangles, which were easier to see which ones those were in the other picture. They those must be there. But what, are, <laughs> what about the other th part here? Is, is that our right triangles? Are those stacky in some way? Maybe that's related to what you were saying. Let's see. Uh, uh, I don't think those, that's weird. I don't, I don't think they're stacky. Yeah, they don't well, again, stacky. I'm being so sloppy about whether we're including the orientation or not. Um, well, here are your, here you are. I mean, are not. those the right triangles? Let's see, go ahead, yeah? I mean, if you're thinking of one oh, oh, uh, of this thing is the space you're interested in, that's, you're modding out by orientation reversals. Yeah, I mean, so let, let's see where this is here. I mean, this is like here. Is that right? <laughs> so what's going on there? So these are isosceles triangles. What are these things here? Those are, ah, those are isosceles triangles too. So apparently these are isosceles too. Am I totally confused about that? Oh, I guess you got to be, it's got to be right just because the, if we're modding out by the three bang symmetry, those, yeah. both of those lines there are invariant under some of the three bang. Oh, okay. So I guess what you're telling me here is that there are two kinds of isosceles triangles, ones where the odd man out is short and the ones where the odd man out is long. And, and, uh, I didn't quite hear that. So there's, well, I think I get it. So you're saying there are two kinds of isosceles. Yeah. Is there an audio problem? Because I'm having great audio here, but yeah. No, it's just some internet problem. Yeah. So, okay. so which ones are the. Yeah, that's my question. <laughs> which ones? Oh, which I, ones see, have I, these? See. I, I, I see. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. So there's they're long isosceles triangles, there's short isosceles triangles, and in, right in between. There's equilateral triangle, which is the center point, which is that center, yeah. So yeah, yeah. So they're like, yeah, they're like isosceles needles, and then little isosceles stubs or something like that. So where are the needles? And where? Oh, so the needles must be. Oh no, <laughs> where are they? Um, well, it's easier to see it in the green in picture B. The needles. Yeah. So right, these must be the these must be the the stubby ones, like. You know, they have to be bigger yeah. than a, you know, they're like, they're in between that right triangle and that equilateral triangle. They're, you know, in, in, in there. Yeah. The Whereas the ones that are longer than that are over here. So yeah, that was confusing me that, but, but, you know, you can figure these, these things out. So um, th these are the pointy ones. Yeah. And these are isosceles, but they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you can see that they're isosceles because, I, I mean, this radius is the same as this radius or something like that. On that arc. Yeah. The circle. Right. Yep. Yeah. It's not that hard yeah. to see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. That's good. And then there's the. And then they're the right triangles and they're not stacky points. So where are those? They're the other side of this little triangle here, the one that you didn't comment on yet. Okay, okay, okay. And that I know for sure. And I think that they are not, I don't see why they would have any symmetry. So I don't think they're stacky points. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. Yeah, I was just getting confused about so, um, so one of the things that you can see uh, about this, um, 
this particular topos. I mean, I don't, I don't even know how, you know, to what extent is this kind of visual visualization legitimate for toposes? It's, it's legitimate for some kind of toposes to some extent. But what I'm thinking here is if I look at the stacky part of this topos, and then if I look at the unstack, the complement to that, the unstacky part of the topos, that unstacky part is, um, is very uh, contractible. Mm -hmm. And so, so that leads to this little lemma that I mentioned, um, which says that, so first of all, I call this topos, I think it's called the topos of acute triangles, if you're describing what the points are. Um, but I also sometimes call it the Toblerone topos. You know, if you think in terms of the variable points of this uh, topos, like the points indexed by the unit interval, they kind of look like Toblerones, which was, I probably should have known that, that but somebody had to point it out to me when I was talking about this stuff. Um, well, and I mean, um, Simon wasn't there for that. So, I mean, they look like a, <laughs> every slice of a Toblerone is more or less the same kind of triangle. Yeah, well, I guess we're just simplifying this tilbara, but then you can imagine weird ones where the where they the shape of the acute triangle changed right. as you went along, and that would be yes, like as, as 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 somebody put it to me that these are Toblerones that have been lying out in the sun too long. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, and then instead of using this, instead of taking the unit interval as the parameter space, you could take, for example, the circle as the parameter space, your parameter topos. And you could look at, you know, so, you, so you're looking at kind of loops in this topos. Uh, so those are kind of, you know, Merbius or non-Merbius Toblerones. And um, so, uh, so wh what I'm trying to say here is that, yeah, there's a little lemma that, that goes like this. It says, if you've got a, uh, if you've got a, a, uh, if, 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 if you've got a loop in the topos of acute triangles, in other words, if you've got one of these circular to Toblerones, circular melty <coughs> Toblerones, I guess, yeah, little Dali-esque, Toblerones, I guess. Um, a circular Toblerone, then you can ask whether it's just the uh, top a lot. What am I trying to say? You can ask whether it's this. I'm not sure how to say it here, but you, you, but you can talk about, you know, whether it's got a Merbius twist in it or, or something like that. Um, Merbius, you know, in the ternary sense, I guess, right? I mean, we've got these triangles, but you can you can put a twist in them. You can put a one third twist in them before you join the ends of the Toblerone together. Um, so you can ask when you have one of these circular Toblerones, you can ask whether it's uh, uh, homotopy theoretically uh, trivial or something like that. And so uh, the point I'm trying to belabor here is that if you've got one of these topologically non-trivial ones, homo, if you've got one of these homo, homotopically non-trivial ones, a genuinely Merbius Toblerone, then one of these slices, one of these cross sections has to be isosceles at least. Because, um, well, one way to say it is because the unstacky points are contractible, right? So if you're kind of, if you're avoiding the stacky part of the topos, then you're just inside this contractible space. And so your loop is just going to be a, a trivial loop, a, homo, a null homotopic loop. Um, so that the only way you can get one of these Merbius ones is if you visit, if your loop visits the stacky part of, of, the, of the topos. But another way to describe that proof is to say that if you have one of these, to one of these loops, <laughs> one of these circular Toblerones. And if no cross section of it is isosceles, then you can sort of comb the, the Toblerone to make it, uh, John didn't like calling this combing, I think. Do you have a better word for it, John? But you can, you know, you can, 
right? Each, each of the triangles has a longest side, a, a middle side, and a shortest side. And, and you know, there's a consistent choice of those because you're not allowed to have the longest one, you know, the, the longest side, the longest length isn't allowed to coincide with the next length, et cetera, et cetera. So that's just another way of expressing the another way of expressing the proof of the same limit. But I think if you share those two proofs. So, sorry, what <coughs> what was counting? Say that again. What what was counting? Combing. Oh, combing. 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 Ah. combing. I'm thinking of like combing a braid or something like that. I mean, you know, oh, you may have this. Visualizing the twist in the. Ah, right. So, right. Okay. Yeah. So I thought you were counting, putting an extra. <laughs> yeah. No, okay. Ahead. So. Um, Yes. Okay. So, um, oh yeah. So, uh, again, I could argue against my suggestion here. I write. I could, there are all sorts of other toposes that might be good first examples to teach people about what a topos is. But I, I I'm, I'm toying with this idea that you could teach teach people this example of a of a topos to get an, a, a sense of what a topos is. I mean, there. there I mean, there are so many ways of thinking about toposes, but I, I, you know, this sort of orbifold way of thinking about toposes or some toposes is uh, a good way of thinking about them, I think. Um, Have you uh, again, because it suggests, right? So one of these orbifold topos, I mean, yeah. That, or, or one of these orbit these orbit toposes, Right, I probably didn't say, I probably, I probably didn't say this part out loud yet, so I'm gonna to try to say it out loud now. That these orbit toposes, you can think of them as being, you know, the topos of torsors of the group. Or torsors, yeah, well, <laughs> the, 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 yeah, it's, it's, it's the, to the topos of torsors uh, of the group that you're modding out by, uh, but possibly equipped with some extra structure. This torso may be equipped with some extra structure. So, and this extra structure would consist of some sort of equivariant data, equivariant labeling, or something like that. And, and you know, so, so that's kind of what's 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 going on here. That so, what what what, what am I trying to say? That you know, torsos of a group are really good examples of objects. Uh, you know, things that aren't just like points, things that are actually have automorphism groups, obviously. I mean, that's the whole purpose of a of torsors is to bring into existence something that has a, a non-trivial automorphism group. Um, so I still didn't say that very well, but I'm struggling to say something there. So, um, so. Are you trying to think of the yeah. points of the, so what are the torsors? The torsors aren't the points of this topos, are they? No, but there's a. What, what I'm saying is that there's a um, there's a geometric morphism in the geometric direction from the topos of acute triangles to the topos of torsors of three back, uh, and and it's simply given by um, How do I say this? Uh, by, by yes, but 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 if you start with a two triangle, you can just remember it's abstract three element set of corners, and and a, a, a three element set, an abstract three element set. Maybe say an abstract decidable three element set is is basically the same thing as a torsor of three bang. So yeah, so so right, so so there's like uh, you know the the topos of a, acute triangles and there's this geometric morphism to the torsors of three bang. And this one is this one this one at top is very visualizable. It's this, you know this picture over here. This one at bottom is very unvisualizable. It's just like a kind of like a point and you know it's just got these automorphisms or something like that. But 
right? So this geometric morphism sort of, in some sense, really embodies the stacky aspect of the topos. So, right, I mean, right? So what am I trying to say? That when you're, when you're creating a theory, you put into the theory objects sometimes, but then you also put in, uh, so object, right, I'll, I'll use my language, right? So, right, so now I have to try to remember what my language is. So my language is um, stuff, structure, and properties. So it's like, right, we're cumulatively building the concept of an acute triangle, but at the base layer, we just put in some stuff. And that stuff is just a three bang towards it. And then at the next level, we put some structure. And, 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 and the structure at, at that point is gonna be something like uh, an assignment to each corner of the triangle, right? I mean, the three bang towards are already has, you can already talk about the corners of the triangle. Uh, but then you put in, you know, like perhaps angle information or something like that. And, um, you know, now, you, now you've added some structure to the models, but then you can go ahead and add some property to the models. You know, you can say that the three angles that you've put in add up to 180 degrees or something like that. And at that point, you're probably more or less done. You've probably created, you've probably sketched this theory. You've created an axiomatization of this theory in this cumulative way of first putting in the structure, then putting in the stuff, and then putting in the, the properties. So this, you this arrow, Say it again. You meant to say stuff first, then structure, then property. What did I, what did I say first? Well, you can watch the video. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, I meant to say stuff first, and then structure, and then property. So that I'm saying that this projection here has the vague flavor of being, in a very imprecise sense, it's you know it's sort of like a one one of these uh, Postnikov or more. What's it called? More Postnikov, you know, there are these more Postnikov factorizations or something like that. It's it's vague in sense in, in the sense that you know this sort of. I mean, I have to think about that, but I think it's rough that like, that idea that you know down at the bottom here we just got the pure stuff, and we haven't added any structure yet. So, so I don't think I've quite understood what a three band torso is. I mean, so three is three band just a symmetric group. Sorry, I just realized I said something stupid. So I was very distracted from what you were saying. Can you say what say it again? And then maybe I'll try to fix the stupid thing I said. But yeah, uh, go ahead. So I'm not sure I've understood what the three bang torso is. So is three bang just the symmetric group? Three bang is the symmetric group. Yes. I sometimes call it three bang. I got that habit from a little deer. Yeah. Okay. So, yes. so, so what so what's the map for if I have an acute triangle, what's the associated three bang torso? It's the abstract set of corners of the uh, triangle. You could also think of it as, let's see, if they're oriented, you could think of it as the abstract set of sides of the triangle. Right, okay, okay, thanks. Um, yeah, let, and let me try, let me make a futile attempt to repair the really stupid thing I said. I was trying to liken this geometric morphism to a kind of morphism that appears in a more Postnikov factorization. But I think I've actually kind of got it backwards. <laughs> I think a, an act, a true more Postnikov one would go in the other direction. I'm not even sure if that's the right objects to put there. Um, I, I mean, uh, <laughs> how do I get out of this? Uh, I mean, you can take- post Yeah, go ahead. I mean, if you have a category, you can try to map it to something where you've, some other category where you've forgotten some properties of the objects and then forgot, forget some. Yeah, I mean, when you're doing, sure. when you're, when you're oh, doing more post, when, so go ahead. We're not forgetting the stuff. We, we're just forgetting the property and the structure. And down at the bottom, we still have the stuff, I guess. But that's. That's sort of the direction of convenience, but that's not the Postnikov direction. In the Postnikov thing, you really do, you start out forgetting the stuff is the first thing you forget. And then you forget the structure and then you forget the properties. Uh, and, and, <laughs> so 
But yeah, I'm re I, I, I really screwed that up by dragging us into that. But yeah, so yeah, I, I, let's let's not get into that right now because I screwed up so badly that it. Okay. But if you really want to learn that stuff, then then part of the point is that the Postnikov towers, yeah, they forget the struct, they forget the stuff first, then they forget <laughs> the structure, then they forget the properties. Um, as you're following the arrows downstream, um, and, and 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 those Postnikov things are very unique, right? It's it's, it's a functorial factorization. It's a functorial factorization system, um, but here, on the other hand, we, we're going, we're, we're, we're factorizing, we're, we're factorizing the morphism sort of in the other way that instead of, you know, having the thing that forgets structure followed by the thing that forgets, instead of having the thing that forgets stuff followed by the thing that forgets structure followed by the thing that forgets property, we're forgetting some structure and, and properties first, and then only afterwards are we forgetting the, um, the stuff and what's good about that it, it you know so this is sort of that that's the in some way that's the anti postnikov way of factorizing things <laughs> yeah, but what's good about it is is that it lacks uniqueness so you have lots of choices and you can make choices you know whenever it's convenient you know, whichever one you prefer you know the postnikov thing is very nice because it doesn't give you the freedom to choose the factorization it's kind of unique um but but when you do the anti postnikov factorizations, you have choices to make all over the place. And, and, and that corresponds to the way there are zillions of different axiomatizations of a theory. You know, first you list the stuff in the theory. <laughs> I know you're going back up now. Yeah. <laughs> right. But that's because of the other thing. That's because of the geometry versus the algebra. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> first you list your stuff, then your structure, then your properties. And you could define the same category of final entities start right and in the categorified the algebraic geometry you know the algebra and the geometry are reverse of each other just like in ordinary algebraic geometry all right so sorry so um so one of the things i was trying to say here is something that you brought up last time john um which is um so what am i trying to say here so uh well so I mentioned that, you know, there's this vertical strip picture of the moduli stack of acute triangles. And then there's this Beltrami-Klein equilateral triangle picture of the moduli stack of acute <laughs> And this, um, you know, in this Beltrami-Klein picture, it's very nice that it's just an equilateral triangle. I mean, because it shows you that there's, you know, three, pieces of data uh, at each corner of the triangle. And, you know, you get... Uh, what do you mean three pieces of data? Well, th th I, I, was, I was trying to emphasize that, well, well I mean, uh, so there's this nice system of barycentric coordinates on, a, on, a, on an equilateral triangle. Uh -huh. And those barycentric coordinates for, for the for, for for the for the acute <laughs> the barycentric coordinates on the equilateral triangle, you know, those are sort of coordinates that are associated to each corner of an acute triangle, and they're associated in the same way for each of the three corners of the equilateral triangle. So in other words. You know, I was trying to guess what in this picture, what is the what is the quantity associated to a corner of a triangle that's actually showing up in this picture? You know, this so like there's this barycentric coordinate, right? It's like it's like the the coordinate function is zero down on this base here, and it's one on the top, and it's you know an affine function, it's this. <coughs> and uh -huh. um, it's a very specific, well-defined function. And I wanted to know what it is in terms <coughs> of the geometry of the acute triangle. You know, is it the angle of the acute triangle at that corner? Or is it, what is, what is it? And that was a task that I set for myself to try to figure out what that, what, 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 
what quantities are these? The, the barycentric coordinates on the equilateral triangle, when you construe them as these quantities associated to the corners of an acute triangle, what are they explicitly in terms of the geometry of the acute triangle? And, um, so and I tried to figure, it out? go ahead, John. Yeah, so did you figure it out? I remember the puzzle, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I should explain. I'm glad you explained it because Simon had no idea yeah. what it was, but I'm not now I'm bursting with curiosity. So uh, yeah, I'm really, really close, but uh, <laughs> you know, I, I was I was so close this morning, but I did that, you know, that, that's sort of my excuse for why I showed up late. Um, or one of my excuses. I have many excuses for showing up late, but um I didn't quite finish it. But it is true that, that if 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 you think about it, it's like um it's some function, right? This is where I weasel out. And I say that this coordinate function is some function of the distance from the corner of the triangle to the midpoint of the opposite side. Because if you draw, right? So, I mean, if you draw, if you look at this picture E right here, um, if, you know, if you look at all of the acute triangles, that have their apex right on this circle here. I'm hoping you can see the cursor running along this circle here. Yep. All of those, well, I mean, the, the only acute ones are in between, you know, the, are inside the vertical strip. So in between there and there. But they all have the same distance from the corner of the triangle to the midpoint of the opposite side, right? It's like, right? Yep. Those are all radiuses of the same circle. So, so those are the, um, those are the triangles that share, you know, the, the, the points in the moduli stack that lie on one of these circular arcs are the ones that share the same distance from the corner to the midpoint of the opposite side. And, um, and, and those arcs, if you think about it, if you stare at how the beltrami klein projection works, this circular arc here is one of these straight lines here. So that's because in the that's because in the Poincare upper half plane model of the hyperbolic plane, a whole bunch of straight lines are semicircular. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. And They're that's... semicircular with their center on the real line yeah. itself or something. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. To the and, right you know, the right angle to the, the real line. Yeah. yeah. So in the Beltrami Klein picture, they're the straight lines because the straight lines are the straight lines in the Beltrami yeah. picture. So, um, so it's some function of this. So I actually already told John this last week. I said, "Oh, I've got, I've figured out that this coordinate function, this quantity, is actually just some function of the. Uh, it, it's some function of the." A distance from the corner to the midpoint of the opposite side. So yeah, I, I take my yeah. remark then that that was like no, that, that was no big deal. Um, right, that, right. And John got really confused by being unimpressed by that. He said, well, that's a very weak statement to make. Yeah, I just somehow thought it was, had less information in, in it than it does. Um, so I, it's hard to explain. I guess it's very hard to explain what. <laughs> what well, what but I mean. let me take a because I thought about I thought about it. I thought about it a little bit, and I think I can sort of say something about why it's not such a weaselly answer. I mean, it's still an incomplete answer. I still no. want to know the actual answer because I'm sick of lying to people, or I'm sick sick of telling people that I've halfway figured it out. I want to actually know the answer. Yeah. But today, I have not completely figured it out. I'm still weaseling, but I'm st I'm still trying to prove that. You know that the, the amount that I'm weaseling by is not that bad. So, <laughs> so, okay, let's share the proof. Right. So you know you stare at this picture here. You stare uh -huh. at uh, this picture here. Actually, I guess you stare at both of these pictures. Let me let me redraw them a little bit here. So you've got uh, you've got the, uh, yeah. Maybe I'll just draw the the equilateral triangle and again these. Symmetry axes in them, drawn very, very badly. And now, what am I trying to say? Well, okay. So, 
see, I think what, what's, what's going on here, what am I trying to say? So first of all, let's consider automorphisms of this equilateral triangle, thinking of it as a topological space acted on by three bank. Mm -hmm. So that means, you know, we're looking for, uh, we're, we're looking for auto homeomorphisms of the equilateral triangle oh, that oh, commute oh. with the three bang action. Uh -huh. And hmm. if you think about what those are, I think they're fairly intuitive. Is it clear what they are? Should I say what they are? Uh, say what they are. So you're demanding they map the, yes, yeah, so they map the boundary of the triangle to itself. Right, they have to map the boundary to the, to the triangle of itself. So I, I, th I think the point is that they have, they have a lot of freedom in the middle here, but they're, you know, somewhat constrained here and they're somewhat constrained here and they're really constrained right there, right? I mean, the, the only fixed, the unique fixed point has to go to itself. Yep. And then this whole edge has to go to itself, but it can be reparameterized, except that you have to keep that endpoint fixed. Uh -huh. And this one can be reparameterized, but it has to go to itself, but it can be reparameterized within itself, but you have to keep that endpoint fixed. I guess you have to keep the other endpoint fixed too, because it's, you know, topologically sticks out like a sore thumb. So you kind of, you know, you can, you have to keep the, this midpoint of the triangle fixed, but you can, Reparameterize that, you can reparameterize that. I guess you also have to, I guess you also have to keep, yeah, you have to keep things on that edge, even though they're not stacky, they still stick out like a sore thumb. You have to send that edge to itself, but they can be reparameterized. And then in the middle, you get a lot of freedom about how to reparameterize, except that the boundary has to, you know, stick with whatever reparameterization you already picked. Uh-huh. Okay, and yep. So you can apply those automorphisms, that kind of automorphism, you can apply them to any quantity that you come up with and you'll get some other quantity that, yeah. you know, works, you know, it, it, right? It, it will still have the same moduli stack, but using a different quantity. So, you, you know, you can, one thing you could use is the angle in each corner. Or another thing you could use is this one that shows up in the Beltrami Klein picture, which is the distance from the corner to the midpoint of the opposite side. Um, now, to get that one to really work, you should measure it in terms of, you know, use, use the opposite side as a unit of length. So it's like the ratio between this length and this length or something like that to make it an abstract number or something like that. And you could also use just the length of the opposite side as a fraction of the perimeter of the triangle. You could use that, right? There are all these different, zillion, yep. right? You can get zillions of quantities that all make the moduli stack look like an equilateral triangle. But, you know, they're all really different from each other. I mean, yep. in one yep. way, they're all yep. different from each other. In another way, they're all the same. I mean, they're right. They're all different from each other in the in the in in the in the sense that they're giving you different kind of information about the angle of the acute triangle. But in terms of the abstract moduli stack, they're just you know fixed under the this big automorphism group where you take the automorphisms that are three bang equivariant. So right. Th so this this is this was supposed to accomplish exactly what I said. It's supposed to make my <coughs> <laughs> my original answer, my halfway answer looked not so weaselly, right? Because in other words, just, just saying that it's a function of the distance to the midpoint of the opposite side, that's already giving up, that's narrowing it down a lot. You know, it's saying yep. it's not the angle, it's not the... Yep, uh-huh. Yeah, no, you're right. I, yep. <laughs> yeah. So I agree, yeah. So you're not as bad as I said. <laughs> right, uh. exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So QED, so. Right, right, that's right. So, yeah, but, okay, but someday you'll tell me what function it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, so, um, like I said, I'm very disorganized today, but um, 
Do you want to switch over to the other subject, the, the class field theory subject, or what do we want to call that Montesino stuff? Perhaps, perhaps. <laughs> Does anybody else want to bring anything else up? Um, I mean, we're also allowed to quit early if we want to. Um, let's see. Uh, I wouldn't mind quitting early, actually, because I'm. Uh, I'm talking to too many people. <laughs> <laughs> Simon is here, and I'm talking to him. And then I'm gonna. And then at three, I'm gonna. Sure. Have to. I think. Yeah, so I, I really do want to talk a lot more about this Montesino stuff, but uh -huh. um, you know, it would be starting a second topic today. So maybe it really does make sense to quit early today. Um, <laughs> is there anything else we should do before we quit? Or we do, one thing I just to, wanted to mention yeah, about this, one thing about this stuff is that yeah, you must have observed is that you can think of this stuff as being associated to a particular coxeter group. Yes. Uh, namely, I guess PGL2Z or something. Maybe it's GL2Z. Um, but uh, so the, the the Coxeter group is actually GL two Z. The the reflection group is GL two Z. That's the extended modular group. The the Coxeter re rotation group, you know, the even part of the Coxeter group is the unextended uh, modular group, which is SL two. Yeah, I was worrying about the P or not the P, but okay. Anyway, oh I don't... oh oh, uh, yeah, you're right. I screwed that up. Um, right. Okay. This yeah, is not yeah. Wrong. But but uh, there is that. There is, that's another thing that's always confusing. Yeah, I think I think you have to say PSL and PGL, right? Probably yeah. every time I, I probably accidentally omitted to say the P every time. I'm guessing that that would fix that mistake. Yeah. So go ahead, yeah? Yeah, anyway. Um, so you could try to copy this stuff that you're talking about right now for all sorts of other Coxeter groups. Namely, well, I mean, I have to, I have to, Try to clarify here because I mean there's another coxeter group here which is three back, and I thought maybe you meant we can do we can try to do what you're doing for th we can we can take what we're doing here for three bang and we can try to do it for any other coxeter group. I thought that's what we were going to say. Uh well, yeah, that's, that's very a... that's very easy to do. That's very easy to do. But maybe you really are suggesting something more interesting, and you really want to try to do something. You want to try to generalize what we're doing here for this big infinite Coxeter group, this big hyperbolic Coxeter group, and you want to try to generalize that to other Coxeter groups. And I'm glad you said that because that actually reminds me of something I had forgotten to say, but am I totally misinterpreting you now? Go, go ahead, what are you trying to say? Yeah, I, I, well, yeah, you're right that they're both of these and now I'm getting confused about exactly what, they're, what the relation is in the sense that if I start generalizing things, how's, how's, it, gonna, how's it gonna work, but... Um, well, can I say something about that? Because you're really reminding me of something I wanted to say. Okay, sure. Anyway, so, I'm just raising the idea of generalizing this stuff, and you can get some nice geometric examples of other uh, topoi of equivariant sheaves that wouldn't be as quite as uh, <clears throat> elementary because they wouldn't be about like two dimensional things, maybe, but they would still be pretty geometrical. Yeah. So, uh, I, I, um, so. Right, I have an idea roughly along the lines of what you're suggesting, uh, and um, or a specific, a rather specific case of what you're suggesting, and and a possibly interesting one. So, I mean, you know, we have this, you know, the, the moduli stack of elliptic curves. It is is related to um, this uh, this hyperbolic Coxeter group that we've been drawing here. Um, this P G L two comma Z. If I didn't screw up, um, so Z. Okay. <laughs> sometimes I do. Not just um, Simon's presence here. Yeah, I was first fighting against Dang Z. Okay, go on. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, but uh, right. I mean, look at curves. Those are just the they're they can be seen as special cases of other interesting things. So, I mean, you can see them as special cases of abelian varieties. 
um, you know, the elliptic curves are the dimension one B in varieties over the complex number. Um, so you can look at, you know, dimension D of B in varieties over the complex numbers. And it's really inter interesting to look at the moduli stack of that. And or are the polarized, polarized ones or something like that? To yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And I haven't thought about this in a while, but yeah, but but it's actually yes. But it, I haven't so forgotten too much of it, but I just haven't thought about it in a while. But um, so I, what are we trying to say? That the group SL2Z has another name, which is just the symplectic group for a two-dimensional symplectic vector space. Um, and oh. if you generalize that aspect of that group, then or that's symplectic. very much connected to what you were saying about the moduli stack of yeah. principally polarized Gabian varieties of dimension D. So there's, you know, sim some symplectic. So, yeah. So, yeah, so just to, for the record, so that nobody watches this video and accuses us of Inaccuracy. I mean, so it's SL2R is the symplectic group, and then it has this, I guess they even call it like a lattice in it, uh, SL2Z. Yes, but it's also a symplectic group of some kind. It's like a, yeah, it's like a, yeah, it's like an integral form of the symplectic group. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Yes. Anyways, yes. Well, and there's so many things that we are being sloppy and inaccurate about that, <laughs> that didn't even help at all. Okay, great. Well, anyway, I thought it helped, but okay. But, 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 but the point is that my attempted interpretation of your suggestion yeah. to generalize this is, <laughs> is, is exactly in this direction. That, yeah, so uh, then we get into this. Um, and I've thought about a little bit th about this, but I haven't made much progress with it at, at all. But, it, but, but yeah, I think this is an interesting direction to try to generalize. Yeah. Um, What's what, the buzzword for the, that generalization? I'm blanking out on the guy whose half space is generalized. Uh, Siegel. Uh, S I E. Yeah. Siegel. S I E T E L. Siegel upper half space. So that's like Siegel upper half space. Yeah. Of this game. Yes. Yeah. So and I've I, never like seen. A, a I mean, picture. I have to stop and think about whether that's even a cocksure group. Um, but what were you going to say? Go ahead. Yeah. Like if you tried even, to even draw. Even if it isn't a cocksure group, you can still. You know, do this kind of thing, and it's like a Shimura right. variety or something like that. Yeah. Um, what sort of like what's the next dimensional case of what's like when you go up to the next case <laughs> right after yes. the case that we're looking at? Yeah, it's two dimensional Abelian varieties. Yes. Yeah. So then, this uh, hyperbolic plane here turns into a a which is two real dimensional. Yeah, it turns into a four real dimensional <laughs> thing. Uh, is that right? I used to know this dimension. I can't remember. Yeah, uh, yeah, anyway. Right at my fingertips. Uh, let's see. Um, well, uh, let's see. So there's a, mm, let's see. I don't, I don't know why I thought it would go up by two. Um, no, I think you're right. I think it goes by triangle numbers. I think it goes one, three, six, ten, fifteen, or something. Okay. Like that. Well, right. then I'm just completely lucked out. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, right? There's also the moduli stack of genus G curves, which fits in so sort of inside the moduli stack of dimension D polarized abelian varieties, and those. You know, the numerology of those goes something like one, three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen. So that's fitting inside one, three, six, ten. You know, that's one, three, six, nine, twelve. There's a, there's a hiccup. That's the one of these hiccups at the start there. Yeah, yeah, that's a hiccup. And you can even understand why there's a hiccup there, but yeah. Um yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Anyway, so it could yeah. Well, I was just asking about the dimension because it would be it's too bad there's not like a we're right, so it's six complex dimensions. dimensions. It's, it's, sorry, it's three complex dimensions, which is six real dimensions. So it's a little bit hard for me personally to visualize. <laughs> um, yeah, but, but, but it's still fun to, to, to try to make progress with it. It's still fun to try to make progress with it. Um, I mean, it's, you know, it's fun to make, try to make progress with it in you know, sophisticated ways, uh, but it's also fun to try to make 
progress with it in very unsophisticated ways, even though it's hard to picture. No. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, the idea, because that's, you know, that, that's a vague idea that I've been thinking about, about, you know, what happens to these acute triangles? So you're, 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 you're trying to tell me that there's some sort of three complex dimensional generalization of an acute triangle that I should be trying to understand. Um, I guess, yeah. I mean, I would have been hoping that there would be something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just can't remember what this is. I have a feeling. Point. I have a feeling that there really is something good here, but I just don't remember offhand what it's like. And I'm not sure I've got very far with it. But still, I think there's something <laughs> there. They're fun things to think about there. Um. So, yeah, so maybe it's going off in a different direction than to try to generalize from the acute triangles to like acute tetrahedra. That, but that's also very interesting to, to uh -huh. this, this fun stuff about that too. It's replacing three bang with four bang. Yes, yes. Yes, I mean, uh, I mean, you know, we're definitely at a sort of crossroads where some roads diverge from. So, um, or mm -hmm. a crossroads or a bottleneck or something. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's, uh, uh -huh. So yeah, there's there's multiple general multiple directions of generalization, and you have to exercise your personal taste about which directions to pursue. Or there may be you know there may be very interesting interconnections between these different directions of generalization, as there is right. I mean you know so you can follow the curves direction of generalization, or you can follow the abelian varieties direction of generalization. But there's this very intimate uh, interrelationship between those, which is that every curve of genus G has a Jacobian abelian variety of dimension G. I hope I said that more or less correctly. Um, but, um, you yeah. know, so when you're When you're pursuing these multiple generalizations, you're not just pursuing them in isolation. You're actually trying to understand the interconnections between these different generalizations. So, uh, do you have any more neat ideas to bring up here? Because that, that that was very helpful. Um, and, and anything uh, no. else we should do before we quit? Okay, I guess no, no, no. Um, I guess this is a good place to quit. Okay, okay. okay. Bye, Simon. Yeah. Yep. Okay, okay see ya. bye John. Bye. Yep. Thanks a lot. Bye. Yep. See ya.